another episode of Corona Chemistry Season 2, AP Edition. This episode featuring bonding intermolecular forces and little tips and tricks you can do in the lab, such as column chromatography, Beer's Law, and of course, sample multiple choice and fear response questions to follow to get you amped up, juiced up, and ready to go with the content related to these topics. As always, you can find the notes, links to the notes, and these slides that are on the screen right in front of you, just beneath my lovely face on your screen, below in this video in the description. Click on those. Follow along. Let's jump into it! Because as it stands, our first few topics of today are very much reviewed. So I am going to throw a link to my older videos in Season 1 of Corona Chemistry in here as well. Uh, because when I talk about types of bonding, this should not be overall new to us. There are a few things in here that are going to be newish, newer, and we're going to add some terminology. But all in all, when I look at ionic bonding, that should be done and done for us. Of course, ionic bonding is the transfer of electrons typically from a metal to a nonmetal. Metals want to lose electrons. Nonmetals want to gain electrons, which is why they're a match made in heaven. And because of this, it creates a very very strong tight bond and they arrange themselves into a very tight knit lattice formation where everyone is attracted to everyone around them and as you can imagine that's very hard to disrupt as you can see at the bottom of your screen there all those little sodium cations that have shrunk down after losing their electrons and all those chlorine anions growing a little bit larger after gaining those electrons but they're all attracted to everything around them that's strong which is why these ionic bonds that we see have very, very high melting and boiling points and, of course, are an incredibly powerful, powerful form of uh, intramolecular force as our discussions go here. But that's not where we're stopping here. What the heck is lattice energy? It might have been mentioned in your sophomore level class or your first level of chemistry, and you might not have actually gotten to the point where you were talking about something like Coulomb's Law. Maybe your teacher didn't mention it. But Coulomb's Law is an incredibly important law. Uh, also featured in several physics topics as well. But it is a relationship between how far apart two bodies are and, of course, the value of the charge between them. So the higher the charge, the stronger the value associated with this. But, of course, the closer you are, the stronger the value is going to be. Right? Coulomb's Law effectively states uh, just how... Well, we can read it right here. The higher the charge, the smaller the atoms, the greater the stability. The closer they can get all snuggled up to one another, you know, on a couch, curled up underneath a blanket watching Disney Pixar's Ratatouille on a Friday night. I wish I could sing that French song to you right now, but I... Like, it's in my head right now. But I... I, I wouldn't do it justice. I simply wouldn't do it justice. But that's Ionic Bonding and Lattice Energy. Uh, and, and it will pop up in one of our multiple choice questions here a little bit later on, but very, very simple topic, I believe, and, and mostly reviewed to us. Let's go into Metallic Bonding. Which, the, the question that you might want to ask yourselves is really stemming from after just covering ionic bonding, and you understand that metals and nonmetals go together because they have opposite goals, opposite pathways to happiness, which is why they work. So why would metals ever get together? If metals want to lose electrons to become happy and stable, then why would two metal atoms ever get together? And that's a valid question. But you're assuming that they get together in the same mechanism that ionic bonding does. And metallic bonding doesn't work that way. Essentially, it works as a babysitting co-op where all the atoms are next to each other and all the electron clouds are overlapping with one another. And essentially, the electrons from one atom over here can get dumped off and transport themselves to the atoms across whatever this body is. And that nucleus can take care of those electrons for a while. So essentially, these atoms take turns being miserable with extra electrons more than they want, uh, and, you know, the, the electrons that they actually want in order to achieve stability. And that delocalization of the electrons is known as the C of electrons. That is the, the bold statement on our screen here uh, that is typically the, just the three-word combination that explains how metallic bonding works. Uh, and I'm sure we know what the word alloys are. But alloys are kind of a cool topic. They do appear very seldomly on the AP test, which is why we'll hit it here. There are two different types of alloys. Alloys, of course, are uh, mixtures of metals where they melt them down and put them all together, and then you get different looks, different aesthetics, and different properties uh, or, or the combination of properties of these metals resulting in really, really strong structures 
and or jewelry that lasts a really long time with a cool color like rose gold uh white gold that sort of thing those are all alloys and of course uh brass in in band instruments so what are they well you've got interstitial alloys you've got substitutional alloys and as we cover these definitions i feel like the names are fairly intuitive once you have these two definitions interstitial i don't know what the heck that word means prior to this class but it doesn't matter because when i also have the definition of substitutional and i'm wondering which one is which substitutional makes it's very logical sense interstitial interstitial alloys i should say are when two atoms or two metals of very different sizes combine so the little ones snuggle up really really close in between the larger ones it looks very similar to the lattice structure that the ionic compounds we looked at just a second ago look like those little sodiums curling up in between all those larger chlorines that's what's happening with interstitial alloys substitutional alloys two atoms two metals of very similar sizes now that name substitutional makes a whole bunch of sense they can be subs for one another they fulfill the same role essentially that's that but anyways this is why they form really really tight knit structures very strong um intra molecular forces here especially regarding those interstitial alloys because they are so similar to that ionic lattice structure so that's just a couple of little terms here to throw on the top here then we get to covalent bonding and types of bonds sigma and pi bonds and eventually we're going to get into polar and non-polar but all of this should be fairly a great deal of review this really shouldn't be new information to us covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons so there are no transfers so there are no positives no negatives no outright positives and negatives i should say uh, and we're looking at variables such as electronegativity and how large these atoms are when we're looking at the strength of these bonds or we also have in the instance single bonds double bonds triple bonds it should all be flowing back to us now a sigma bond is the first bond formed between any two atoms that's the single bond and then anything formed thereafter whether it's a double or a triple bond that second and third bonds those are both known as pi bonds they have to stretch a little bit further it's the overlapping of different electron orbitals in order to accomplish those but because they're not fully transferring electrons this connection is not as strong as what we see in ionic compounds which is why their properties are a little bit weaker they melt at a lower temperature they boil at a lower temperature sometimes some of these covalent compounds struggle to ever be anything other than gases because their forces are simply not that strong however we've got a contender for strongest intramolecular forces out there we thought ionic bonding was running away with it at least that's i don't tell the full story my first level of this class uh in in honors or pre-ep chemistry whatever you want to call it i just say ionic that's as good as it gets not necessarily true because the close close runner here are network covalent bonds which of course are covalent bonds however a very specific structure with it and the best case example smack in the middle of your screen screen diamonds carbon rearranges itself from its normal uh arrangement of atoms rearranges its arrangement in order to create a very strong and also very similar lattice like structure uh, and we know that diamonds are the hardest substance known to man at least i don't think there's anything that they have cr cooked up in a lab to to rival it right we got those diamond point drills and they're very tough to crack in terms of mineral uh, on the mineral hardness scale i know that diamond is at the tippity top and you also have examples like silicon dioxide, the primary component of sand, that also feature this network covalent uh, solid. And I know you, you're thinking like, well, sand crumbles in my hand. Sure, but the individual molecules that you're looking at, that, incredibly difficult to break. And that's what you're looking at. And, and of course, you're not individual molecules, but the networks that they form. When I, pull out, when I pluck out a grain of sand, it's not just one SiO2, right? It's millions upon millions of it. So lots of stuff in there. And it's very tough to actually crack that. But here we are. And what I mean by crack is I don't mean separating the molecules from each other. I, I, I mean, it is hard. But you, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Okay? I know sand crumbles. But anyways, network covalent bonds are examples of very, very strong structures that aren't ionic. And so it could be a little curveball that they throw at you. I don't see it too often on tests. But hey, when in Rome... Lewis structures flying through this at a rapid pace. Lewis structures should also be a review. 
but they give us so many answers, right? There's so many different topics we can consult as a result of drawing an atom's Lewis structure or a molecule's Lewis structure. And here are the rules right here. Once again, this should mostly be a review. Uh, there will be a link to the former video that I had on how to do these uh, down below in the description. But if you want to get back into the swing of things, here are several examples here. That will force you to do double bonds, triple bonds, uh, consider charges like the instance of carbonate in the top right of your screen. Uh, you've got extended valence or people that have expanded octets on here as well. You got to consider all the variables, right? Go through the steps. Very, very simple. And if you don't want the answers right for you right now, then go ahead and pause this video because I'm going to show the answers in three, two, one. And there they are. Would you look at that? All the answers on your screen. One thing to point out here uh, is in the top right, carbonates. Anything that is not neutral, put brackets around it and put the charge in the top right outside of those brackets. That's a way to signify that there's something else going on, whether electrons were lost or gained. It is necessary for the notation if you were ever asked to draw that on a free response test. Uh, it's actually not uncommon to draw something like this. Sometimes they, they do like more complex molecules. Um, but, of course, the more complex molecules stem from these more basic molecules that you have before you. Uh, so it definitely would behoove you to know what the heck you're doing here. And, of course, you're going to be required to with all the other topics we're talking about thereafter. First of which, formal charge, which this is new. So I'm going to spend a little bit extra time talking about this. Formal charge is the explanation for why CO2 looks like this and not in any of the other two ways that you can think of. Some of, some of your teachers might explain in the first level where they go, oh, well, molecules like to be symmetrical. That is mostly true, but that's not the full explanation. Why do they like that? And it's because of this concept known as formal charge. Because the other question you could ask yourself, uh, or the other configuration you could possibly think of is, why is carbon in the middle? Well, yes, you could base your answer off of the rules here. Well, the least electronegative atom that isn't hydrogen goes in the middle. That's also accurate, but why? Here we get into the explanation of why. Molecules are neutral, inherently neutral, aside from polyatomic ions, right? But most of the examples that we see in front of us are neutral. And all of the atoms themselves want to be neutral as well. What do I mean by that? Well, formal charge is the variable that you've been looking for. Fc for formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons on the specific atom that you are looking at minus the unbonded electron. So that's each individual electron that's in a lone pair. So for every lone pair, that's two unbonded electrons minus the number of bonds. So even though every bond has two electrons in it, each bond only counts as one off this value here. And so to figure out which configuration of a molecule is the one that something is actually going to go with the vast majority of the time, it's based on every individual atom's formal charge in the structure. You're going to go with the structure that has the least amount of atoms with a Z or the least amount of atoms with a non-zero formal charge. And so I've got all three different ways to draw carbon dioxide, which only one of these is truly valid, but it's the explanation for why only one is valid, right? This one on the right should look incredibly alien to us. Um, but we, we, if we just look at an individual oxygen here, on this left structure here, the correct structure. Each oxygen has six valence electrons. They also have four electrons that aren't in bonds. Those are unbonded electrons or lone pairs. Six minus four is two. But also on each of these oxygens, they also have two bonds. And remember what I said, that each bond only counts as one, not two, even though there's two electrons in it. And so it's six minus four minus two, which makes it neutral. This carbon has four valence electrons. It has no unbonded electrons. However, it is attached to four bonds. Four minus four is zero. Whereas if we go over here to this variation of carbon dioxide, which really is the only other contender for uh, how to draw carbon dioxide, this triple bond oxygen over here, putting in a little extra work, he doesn't like that. And let's see why. He's got six valence electrons, right? Oxygen does. Minus two unbonded electrons in this lone pair. Six minus two is four. And four minus three bonds is positive one. <gasps> Not neutral. The agony! Putting in too much work. It's just not fair. And he cries to this other oxygen over here and he says, 
why am I doing 80% of the work on this freaking group project that's worth 45% of our semester grade? And why won't my teacher answer my emails and kick you out of my group or p potentially even expel you to juvie? I've got a lot of pent-up resentment for a kid named Chaz that I was in a group project with in elementary school. I did all of it. Fifth grade, by the way. Fifth grade, so... I think I'm right to, to relish in this anger. The project was over the Statue of Liberty. And my boy Chaz did nothing. So you better believe when Miss Nichols, at the end of the project, gave me the option to review my partner. You better believe I roasted that boy. I put him in the dirt. But I saw his grade later. Still had the same A that I had. Miss Nichols and Chaz, you just got smeared on the number one virtual chemistry channel out there. That's what your mistake so long ago has cost you now. Your reputation on the internet. <laughs> Good luck getting a job. Anyways, let's... Wow. It's crazy how things just get away from us like that. We go to oxygen on the right over here. Six valence electrons, but it has six non-bonded electrons. Six electrons in lone pairs. Six minus six is zero. Minus an extra one from that bond. And we're at negative one. Equally as bad because it is not neutral. We want to be at zero. Balanced. Yin and yang, if you will. And yes, of course, the formal charges will always cancel out to equal the charge of the compound. And the vast majority of our compounds are neutral. So, like, all of these are possible, but this is the most likely, right? This is the most likely, and it's not because of symmetry. It's because of formal charge, and you can do this with any molecule that you've drawn this far, and you can track that sort of thing. Kind of cool. Kind of cool to add a new little wrinkle to something that you already knew a little bit about. Then we get to resonance, which should also be review for most of us. Resonance is when you take an example like carbonate from a couple slides ago, and you're like, hey, I'm at that final step where I have to put an extra bond somewhere. And wouldn't you know, it doesn't matter where it goes. And wouldn't you know that these molecules realize that too. It doesn't matter which oxygen gets the double bond. So what do they do? They share the load. So effectively, all three versions of carbonates exist simultaneously. They pass this double bond around the central atom taking turns with the extra responsibility of sharing that extra electron with carbon in order to make the relationship work. It's like this oxygen down here in the bottom left says, hey guys, listen, I really want to make this relationship work. I'm happy. I know we're all happy, but I want to stay happy. And I'm feeling a little exhausted. I'm putting in, I'm just putting in too much. When I clock out, I better be able to clock out, but I'm just too exhausted at the end of the day. I can't even go home and relax. I get home and my kids are crying for me to cook dinner and I just don't have any energy. And I say, well, why doesn't your dad just pick up McDonald's on the way home? Just give me some peace and quiet while I watch seasons eight and nine of Two and a Half Men, which are noticeably worse than when Charlie Sheen was involved, but I don't care. It is my 23 minutes of Showtime respite that I get every single freaking workday. So get out of my face, Carl and Jiminy. And Jiminy, I'm sorry that we named you that. Resonance is when you have multiple ways to draw something. They all technically exist. And so then we get into another term, which is on your notes, called bond order which is effectively, what is the average amount of bonds in every atom present? Bond order is how many bonds you have, right? If you're a double bond and you're always a double bond, you have a bond order of two. But the reason why this term exists is because this oxygen right here to this carbon doesn't always have a double bond. It only has a double bond a third of the time, which is why on average, the bond order between any carbon and oxygen here is 1.33. There are four bonds present on the structure at all times divided by three atoms attached to the central atom. 4 divided by 3, quick math, 1.33. One and a third bonds. To the next one, Vesper and molecular geometry, the shapes. Yes, you need to know the shapes. You're going to need to memorize them. And AP ramps it up a little bit where they talk about bond angles. They talk about domains, hybridization a little bit more. Uh, so we do need to 
assess this table a little bit deeper than what we had perhaps in our sophomore level. If you are following along in the notes, I did attach the Vesper chart that I use in class at the bottom of the notes, the last couple of pages there. Um, so feel free to consult that. You will, you won't have it on your test, obviously. So you're going to need to know a few things. Um, and what this is going to go into, of course, is you know whether or not a bond is polar. We can assess whether or not a molecule is polar. And so what do these lone pairs do to the bond angles of molecules? That's something that uh, in my first level class with chemistry we don't talk about too much mention it a little bit it is called valence shell electron pair repulsion these lone pairs are a variable they cannot be denied and of course they force these bonded atoms together a little bit closer forcing these things that are already repelling each other to get next to each other so it's a little electrostatic tension that's what these lone pairs are doing and that's why we create the wacky shapes that we see before us. But these shapes, as this table is organized, is based on domains. And domains are a bonded atom or a lone pair on an atom. And so this chart is simply organized by what that combination is. If I've got three atoms attached, no lone pairs, well then from that atom's perspective, it is trigonal planar. And as most of our structures are fairly simple, like the ones right here, where you have one distinct central atom and atoms attached to it, it's very easy to assess the shape. But when you get into more complex structures, you can assess the shape from multiple atoms' perspectives, and it can be different. And that's kind of a wacky thing to think about. But remember, this is all in three-dimensional space, and that's one of the things that I struggle with the most whenever I was uh, in this class learning about this, that these atoms attached are freely rotating in space, and it causes all kinds of wacky things to happen. Really, really cool once you dive that deep into it. And so we get into domains. Once again, a domain is a lone pair or an atom that is attached to that atom. And this is what the shapes are based off of. But this is also hybridization. Because a bond is not a literal line or a rope tied between two atoms. A bond is simply my electron cloud and your electron cloud overlapping. And our electrons can dance in these two zones between one another. Right? Forming this hybrid electron orbital. Right? We talked a little bit about electron configuration and whatnot, a little review on it last video. Well, here we are. This is the result. We've got S's, P's, D's, and F's for electron configuration, sublevels, and orbitals. Well, what happens when they combine? We get some really, really cool shapes that I really think only computer simulations have captured thus far. There's no way for us to physically manifest these just yet. I hope one day that'd be a really cool thing to look at. And so you can imagine these orbitals overlapping. They create cool shapes. We know that S's are spherical, P are dumbbell, D are like this weird four-lobed lotus flower, and sometimes it looks like a doorknob, right? Complex stuff. And then you smush two of those things together, and you get some weird stuff. But what's cool about these questions is that it's very easy because it's just counting one to six, right? If I know how many domains something has, then I know the hybridization of that atom, which is very, very simple. Because S's can only have one orbital, P's can only have three orbitals, D's can only have five orbitals. That has been a fact ever since we started talking about electron configuration. So this is nothing new to us. And so, if I've got two domains, S can only hold one of them. Which means I have to go to the next level, which is going to be P, in order to hold the other one. Which is why if something has two domains, it has an SP hybridization. If something's got four domains, well the first one goes in the S. And then three go into the P sublevel. And the highest that our chart goes on here is six domains. Well, let's just count to six. First one goes into S. The next three go into P. And all I've, all I've got are two left. D2. D can hold up to five with its orbitals. But we only need two because we only get to six domains. And so if you want to take those original drawings that we had before and assess what the hybridization of the central atom is, well, you can very well do that, right? Count the domains, this phosphorus in the center. We've got three chlorines attached. That's three atoms attached and one lone pair. That's four domains. Hence why the hybridization is sp3. HCN is kind of a tricky one. We look at carbon. It's got four bonds, but only two bonded atoms. So only two domains on carbon, which is why it has sp hybridization. And of course, we go through the motions here. The highest we get to is only five domains here. So we get to sp3d1 or just sp3d hybridization for those. But once again, that should most that should largely be a review for us. And if it's not, please do check that link that is below in the description of the video. 
of my throwback video to bonding and intermolecular forces. And now we're finally on the other side of it. We've learned how to draw it. So now I don't just have one molecule in front of me. I've got millions upon trillions upon gazillions in front of me. And how are they working together, interacting with one another? That's what intermolecular forces is. The forces of attraction and repulsion between more than one molecule. Intramolecular forces are the forces we've been talking about thus far. Those specific bonds, ionic bonds, uh, the lattice forces, or actually lattice forces are multiple ionic compounds attached to one another. So scratch that. Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, metallic bonds, those are intramolecular forces. Meanwhile, intermolecular forces, we've got lots of little itty bitties here dancing around. And how are they interacting with one another? That is our question. And so we need to be able to assess bond polarity and molecular polarity. This should, once again, be review. This is more review topics. Bond polarity is based on atoms' electronegativity. We utilize what is called the Linus Pauling scale. We might recall that fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. Francium in the bottom left is going to be towards the lower end of the Linus Pauling scale. Fluorine's top in the charts at about a 4.0. That's it's a 4.0 scale, just like your GPA. It's like GPA is everywhere. Like rank matters and all that jazz where they force these kids to compete against one another in an academic gladiator arena where only the best of the best have a future. That's not real, by the way. That's me making fun of the situation. Listen, I bought into that scam when I was in high school, too. And it, listen, I, I got some good things out of it, okay? But it's a lie! It's just a number on a page, people! Just a number on a page! Anyways, there are three thresholds you should know that settle you into a certain type of bond, whether you're nonpolar, polar, or ionic. The larger the discrepancy between your electronegativities and the two atoms involved in a bond, the more ionic your bond is. Right? Two atoms that are almost identical in electronegativity or, in fact, are identical to one another, like H2 gas, hydrogen gas, well, their electronegativities completely cancel each other out. So that is a nonpolar bond in which the electrons are completely shared. That's not really what we're worried about here. Nonpolar bonds are the most boring. Everything cancels each other out. So what I'm more worried about is what we see at the bottom of our screen here, where there is an, a, a discrepancy in their electronegativities. There's a difference between them. Well, the atom with the larger electronegativity is going to get a greater share of the electrons. Why? Because the exact definition of electronegativity is the ability to attract electrons. So the more electronegative atom can pull those electrons that are shared in the bond closer to it, to where these electrons are spending more time at my house versus your house, because my house is cooler. I mow my yard every freaking weekend, and I've got a hot tub for each of us. We don't even have to share. That's how cool my house is. And I just bought a sea salt and caramel pretzel ice cream. A pint for each of us. Oh, you're allergic to sea salt? Get out of my house. Don't want to talk to you anyway, but leave your electron. <laughs> Anyways, that's, that's what we're talking about here. And that's what it means when a polar bond exists, is that we have a more electronegative element and we have a less electronegative element. The more electronegative will get a partial negative. That's what that little symbol is. looks like a number eight with the, the top right window eaten out of it uh, and a partial positive. Not total transfer of electrons, so not a total negative or not a total positive, but a partial negative and positive. And of course, the larger the difference, the larger the partial is. So that's bond polarity, but what about molecular polarity? Molecular polarity, the name of the game is symmetry. If a molecule is symmetrical, it is nonpolar. However, there are variables that can disrupt the symmetry of an atom. We got an example at the bottom of our screen that is just a textbook example of something that is not symmetrical. This could never be nonpolar down here, the CH3Cl. Because if I drew a line down the middle here to divide this molecule in half, I've got two hydrogens over here, and I've got a hydrogen chlorine over here. And keep in mind, this is a three-dimensional structure in which the atoms attached to the central atom are rotating constantly. It could never be symmetrical. There will always be a chlorine somewhere that a hydrogen can never balance out, and chlorine can never balance out whatever hydrogen is on the other side. So a molecule can never be symmetrical if it's attached to more than one type of thing. But also, think about the shapes. 
What did we say a little ways back about those lone pairs doing to the bond angles of molecules? If we think of the central atom as a tug of war battle, that the bonded atoms are tugging on the central atom, how do they effectively pull on the central atom? Well, symmetry means that every pull is canceled out. If I were to lean back in my chair here and throw one arm way out right and one arm way out left, and I'm getting pulled with equal strength on both sides, then I don't go anywhere. The pulls perfectly cancel each other out. But now what if I put a lone pair of electrons on top of my head that forces my arms downward closer together than they were before because that lone pair is repelling the bonded pairs away from it and forcing those bonded pairs closer together. Well, now both of my arms are tilted downward and I'm getting yanked downward. There's no symmetry there. There's no upward pull to cancel out the downward pull. And so this is not a 100% valid fact, yet very few exceptions, and I'll name the exceptions here in just a second. If your molecule has, or if your central atom on your molecule has a lone pair of electrons or more, then it is a non, or then it is a polar molecule. If your central atom has a lone pair of electrons on it, then it is a polar molecule. The exceptions to that are square planar molecules, which are six domains, four bonded atoms, two lone pairs, and a five-domain linear molecule, which is two atoms attached, three lone pairs. Uh, an example of that is ICL2 with a negative one charge. You get 22 electrons on that molecule. That iodine ends up with three lone pairs on the central atom and two chlorines attached to it. Got to double check that in my brain. I'm right. It's, it feels weird, right? Three lone pairs that are swirling around the central atom. But it forces those two bonded atoms into a 180-degree angle from one another. Perfectly linear, perfectly symmetrical. So very, very niche exceptions to this rule that you're, you're largely not going to see. So if you internalize those two things that were attached to more than one thing, that's going to be polar. And if our central atom has lone pairs, that's going to be polar. Okay, You can pretty much take, to the, take that to the bank, even at the AP level. Now we get into our true... Intermolecular forces, we've got London dispersion forces, LDFs, dipole-dipole, or dip-dip, and hydrogen bonding. This is an order from weakest to strongest, top to bottom. Weakest up here, everything that's got electrons has LDFs, everything, because of the swishing and swooshing, rocking back and forth, lean with it, rock with it. Very weak. But the more electrons you have, the stronger the force becomes. So typically... This is the weakest force. What we mean is relative to hydrogen bonding, London dispersion forces are weaker. However, if I get more and more and more and more electrons, then yes, an LDF could potentially overpower a dip-dip or a hydrogen bond, but it does take a very specific situation and does take a good, great deal of electrons. This should largely be a review as well. Dipole-dipole forces are the forces exhibited between polar molecules. The reason why they are stronger than London dispersion forces typically is because London dispersion forces are very quick and temporary dipoles, temporary uh, positives and negatives that are attracted to one another. However, in dipole-dipole, they're permanent partial negatives and partial positives. Therefore, the attraction or the repulsion is always there. And then hydrogen bonding is just a very special example of dipole-dipole. And it's not just hydrogen bonded to something. It's when hydrogen is bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, the three most electronegative atoms on the periodic table that aren't chlorine. Now we get into a little more new stuff. Some techniques involving that polarity we were just talking about. Textbook rule is like dissolves like. And what that means is if I need to dissolve something that's polar, then I use a polar substance, a polar solvent. If I need to dissolve something that's nonpolar, then I use something that is nonpolar. Water and oil don't go together. Right? They use that as an example, like a metaphor on The Bachelorette. We're like oil and water, Kyle. We'll never go together. We're immiscible. But the Bachelorette doesn't even know why she's saying that. She doesn't know why it is. And we've heard terms like hydrophilic, hydrophobic. But why is that? Water is very polar. Oil is not polar. That's why. They don't like each other. Paper chromatography is a way of separating a mixture, but also assessing certain characteristics and qualities about things. So effectively, what you do is you've got little strips of paper, and I'll show you a picture on the next screen. Actually, let's just scroll to that right now. Little strips of paper 
and you put the little substance at the top, right? But you've got a solvent. Actually, this is, I believe this is the top where it starts in, I think this is upside down. Honestly, I can't tell. It doesn't matter, right? The longer the streak is, that's going to give us the information that we need. But either way, you put a solvent at the bottom. And the solvent is either polar or nonpolar. And depending on what substances are in the paper, whether they are polar or nonpolar determines whether they like what they are gravitating towards, as gravity is a factor here. You've hung this paper upside down, and the substances are descending down the paper. So polar substances will be attracted to polar solvents and therefore descend the paper more quickly. Nonpolar solvents will descend a little bit, but because they don't like where they're going, they resist it. Think of it like kids on a water slide that are now scared. They've already started to go down, but now they're scared, so they flex their arms and their legs out, and they jam themselves up in the tube. And what do you do? You send a big fifth grader down after to just, just donkey kick the kid in the spine just to launch him forward. And then that kid's crying at the bottom of the slide, but the lifeguard kicks him out of the park anyway. And says your mom raised a coward. That summer sucked, man. That summer sucked. Anyways, the value associated with this that determines, uh, I guess, the similarity of polarity to whatever substance you're looking at is known as an RF value. And RF, the equation for it, if you will, is distance traveled by whatever you're assessing over the distance traveled by the solvent. And so if something is very chemically similar to the solvent, then it's going to travel almost hand-in-hand -hand with the solvent. Because what you do is you let this test run until the solvent gets to the bottom, right? Solve Everything starts at the top. Once the solvent hits the bottom, stop it, right? Well, your solute is either going to travel right with it or halfway, or it's going to stay towards the top. But if it's sort of a one-to-one -one ratio, well, then one divided by one, your RF value will be closer to one. The more attracted the solute is to the solvent, the greater the distance it will travel with the solvent. The more I like you, the more I'll stick with you. It's crazy, right? Crazy that sometimes we don't know that someone likes us, but they ask to hang out with us all the time and they ask to FaceTime you every night. It's crazy. It's crazy. So the closer your value to one is, the more attracted the solute is to the solvent because this ratio, it can't be greater than one. Uh, your solvent will always travel faster. And so you can get values really, really close to one if the solute is very attracted to the solvent. So let's do a little scenario here, a little pre-question. If water is your solvent, polar solutes will follow more closely while non-polar solutes will lag behind. If cyclohexane is your solvent, non-polar solutes will follow more closely while polar solutes will lag behind. What would the RF values for polar and non-polar solutes be in each of these situations? So if you've got a polar solvent and you've got a non-polar thing tracking down the paper with it, what would its RF value be? Closer to one, closer to none. And a polar with a polar, closer to one, closer to none. And of course, if you have a non-polar solvent, what would a non-polar solute's RF value be relative to it? Closer to one or closer to none? Little, little thinker. Not too much of a thinker. I feel like we've pretty much given the answer away. But hey, here we are. Column chromatography, pretty similar stuff. Uh, I, I, I've never actually seen questions on this on the AP test. I, I just see it as a topic that's mentioned in, in, in the class. And so effectively, it's doing the same thing as paper chromatography. Um, just throwing it in here. It, it's another column. It, it's another column, right? Paper is just a flat column, right? <laughs> just a flat column beer's law this one is fairly new and this is the only math portion of these sets of topics that i've seen very simple equation rolls up the tongue big a is equal to abc but beer's law is how we can calculate the concentration of a solution over time based on how much light is getting through or how much light is being absorbed by that substance and because different substances absorb light at different rates, absorb different frequencies of light at different rates because we respond to the electromagnetic spectrum in different ways, well, there's an optimal value to assess, which is what we see on our chart here. The absorption spectrum of cobalt-2 chloride. Well, 
this is the wavelength in light in which it is actually absorbing. So peak absorption is where I want to assess this. So if I wanted to track uh, any calculations with Beer's Law associated with this solution of COCl2, then I would go to the peak here, which is about 550 nanometers or so, which that's something that will appear a little bit later on. But the equation is very simple. A is equal to absorbance. So that's what we see on the y-axis here. A is a constant, molar absorptivity. And that's something we're going to be able to devise based on this chart here. B is equal to the path length, which is something you're actually going to do, utilizing this machine called a spectrophotometer in your lab procedures in class. You can see how far the pathway is going to go. The distance, or sorry, this comma is clarifying what's going what it is. The distance the light is traveling through the solution. And then C is the concentration. So if we have any three of these values on here, we can solve for the fourth, right? Vast majority of the time, you're solving for the concentration of your solution. Very common lab practice done rel related to this topic in here. So let's take a look. Um, just clarifying once again, what we can do is we can change this plot into a linear graph, and then the slope of this, the slope of this linear graph is going to be equal to the molar absorptivity of the Beer's Law equation, so the little a in this function here. That's what we're going for here. And so I'm not too sure what makes a solution not valid for Beer's Law. Um, actually, we'll talk a little bit about that in one of our questions here. Uh, if, if a solution just doesn't absorb light on the visible spectrum, well, then that would constitute why Beer's Law doesn't really apply to it. But a lot of these colored solutions like Gatorades or any solution that changes colors naturally, cobalt is, is red in a lot of solutions, blue in certain solutions, um, so you're looking for that, which typically means they're responding to light in a certain way. Um, but not every solution meets the criteria in which you can make this linear plot is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so the linear plot is important because we can assess the slope from that. And that's where we get the, the lowercase a value in big A is equal to A, B, C. Example, a sample has been prepared with an unknown concentration. The absorbance was 0 0.037. The path length was 0 0.5 centimeters, and the molar absorption coefficient is 493 over molarity over uh, centimeters. I believe I pulled this from a, a chemistry textbook I saw online. What is the concentration of this sample? And so if you'll recall, we go back to our equation set up here. Concentration is C. So we're simply solving for C here. Very simple. All we got to do is rearrange the equation to solve for C making sure we're following PEMDAS, that the denominator is going to be multiplied before we actually divide the numerator by it. So 0 0.037 here divided by 493 and 0.5 centimeters to get the concentration to be 0 0.00015 or 1.5 times 10 to the negative fourth power as a concentration. Remember, this bracket signifies molarity. Very simple. So calculations for Beer's Law, I, I don't think they're too common on free response sections of the test. Uh, I, I don't know how common they are in the multiple choice section either, but if they are, math is simple. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this equation is provided to you on the formula chart, um, but I feel like A is equal to ABC is pretty simple. Remember, you just got to remember what each letter stands for. That's, that's the tricky part with this. Uh, but all in all, very, very simple to plug in here. I would say the more stressful component that comes with Beer's Law is probably in your AP labs that you're doing in class, where you're having to get that plot line nice and right, that percent error nice and right, to your teacher's prestigious opinion. Let's jump into some sample free response and multiple choices, shall we? We've hit all the topics. I've been talking for a bit, but the voice is still going strong, so let's keep it going. Which of the following substances would be the best conductor of electricity? And remember, I am taking these from past AP tests and also review books that I've seen and uh, response sections online that I've seen. So I'm pulling from multiple sources in all of these videos. So you're getting good practice here, but they're all valid questions that you could very well see on an AP test. Which of the following substances would be the best conductor of electricity? This is going more in line with uh, the, the vocab electrolytes, which we didn't actually explicitly talk about in this video, but it does have to do with dissociation and the ionic compounds versus covalent compounds we were talking about at the beginning of this video. So what would be the best conductor of electricity? Well, case, uh, just period, the best conductor is the one that has the most ions in the solution. Water actually doesn't conduct electricity. It's the stuff in water that allows water to conduct electricity. But just straight up H2O doesn't have the ions in order to carry a current of electricity through it. But of course, water coming out your tap 
isn't just H2O. It's got all kinds of other stuff dissolved in it. So when I'm looking at this, there's an answer choice we can throw out immediately, and that's B, CCL4, because that is a covalent compound. Covalent compounds do not transfer electrons. There is no positive. There is no negative. Therefore, there are no ions in solution for the electricity to be carried through which means it's now between A, C, and D, which are all ionic compounds. But if we're looking at this, when they dissolve in water, they all break apart into their associated cation pieces and anion pieces. This breaks apart into K plus and F minus, Ba2 plus, S2 minus. The charges are stronger. Ooh, maybe that's why it might be the answer. But then you get D, Sr2 plus, and there are two bromines here which separates into um, monoatomic bromide ions, but there's twice as many bromine ions as there are strontium ions because it takes two bromines to satisfy the two-plus charge of strontium. More ions equals better conduction. It's not the higher your charge is. So C is a pretty good bait answer, right? I would think that most kids would probably be able to narrow it down between C and D, uh, assuming that we can get rid of B, right? If we look at that little four, maybe that might lure us in but b is a covalent compound so we should be able to immediately get rid of that so c and d the reason why d is the correct answer is because this breaks apart into three pieces one strontium and two bromines whereas c and a only break apart into two pieces k plus and f minus for a ba2 plus and s2 minus for c so not as many ions therefore not uh, going to conduct as electricity as well as d which of the following pairs of elements is most likely to create an interstitial alloy? Remember, this is that term that I was saying where, oh my gosh, it's a toss-up. I don't know if it's interstitial or substitutional. I get those mixed up. The term substitutional should be logical to you, intuitive to you. Substitutional is when two atoms are very similar in size to one another. Interstitial means they're very far apart. So I'm effectively going to take the two metals here that are the furthest apart in size from one another, and that's going to be an interstitial alloy. And so titanium and copper, they're on the same period, period three of the periodic table. Magnesium and calcium are one, one group down from one another, right? Or two groups. No, one group. Group three, group or period three, period four. Uh, silver and tin, further apart, but still not as far apart as aluminum and lead, which are several periods away from one another. So B is going to be your best option there. Lead's going to be a pretty beefy um, atom, whereas aluminum is going to be pretty small and can fit nice and snugly in between those lead atoms. Which of the volume molecules would have the highest lattice energy? Which brings about our lovely topic of Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's Law is a function of both the value of the charge, so now the value of the charge does matter, and how close the atoms are to one another. So we need positive charge, we need negative charge, which is why we should be able to eliminate, once again, another answer choice right off the bat, and that answer choice is D. C2H6 is a covalent compound. It will not form that lattice structure we're looking at because it is a covalent compound and not a covalent network solid at that, which leaves us A, B, and C. And if Coulomb's law is a function of charge as well as distance, well then, what other answer choice can we eliminate out of the gates? And that is A. A is going to be eliminated because lithium has a charge of 1, fluorine has a charge of negative 1. So they're just charges of 1. Whereas both B and C have a metal that is a charge of 2. So A is off the board, and it's between B and C. MgCl2, CaBr2. Why is one answer better than the other? We've already narrowed it down to these two choices because of the charge, which means the only way to be able to distinguish between these two is the distance between those atoms, the other variable in Coulomb's law, the radius between the nuclei of those atoms. The smaller the distance, the stronger the Coulombic forces will be, the Coulombic attraction. So you're looking for the atoms that can get closer together, the two smaller atoms getting together, which is why the answer is going to be MgCl2. Because actually, in answer choice C, calcium is larger than magnesium, and bromine is larger than chlorine. So these atoms aren't going to be able to get as snugly together at night as MgCl2 is. The answer is B. Based on the following Lewis structures, which would travel the furthest in a paper chromatography experiment that is utilizing a polar solvent? And of course, we got these pictures here taken from a lovely iPhone 8S snapshot from my phone. Yes, yes, yes. Taking a picture of a, re a re review book here. Good Lord. Utilizing a polar solvent, which means I'm looking for something that is polar to be attracted to it. 
If we're looking at pentane, perfectly symmetrical. Perfectly symmetrical. Just a hydrocarbon molecule. Nothing polar about it. Not going to be pentane. If I'm looking at ether, this O smack in the middle makes it look really cool. But once again, perfectly symmetrical. It is a non-polar molecule. Then we get acetone. It is polar, right? This oxygen is freely rotating around this central carbon. However, the thing that should stick out to us right away, if we're thinking polar solvent, just go ahead and substitute that with water. Which would travel the furthest in a paper chromatography experiment that is utilizing water? Water, chock full of hydrogen bonds. Methanol, I see this hydrogen bond right up here. The answer is A. That one should be a pretty quick one. It should Our, our eyes should catch on to that pretty quickly uh, when we get into test-taking shape. Use the following structures to answer our next few questions. While in the liquid state, which two substances are most likely to be miscible with water? Like dissolves like. Miscible means uh, soluble, right? Or mixable, if you will, with water. So we're looking for two things that are polar. And this is the same section like of this review book. So th these really are redundant questions because this one kind of already gives away one of the answers here. Um, while in the liquid state, which two substances are most likely to be miscible with water? Well, we already said methanol has the hydrogen bonding that water does. So methanol is going to be one of our choices, right? There is only one answer choice with that. But let's let's look at the other one that, that we're looking at here. Ethanol. Ethene is completely symmetrical, nonpolar. Propane is just another hydrocarbon, nonpolar, right? These guys are not polar. Therefore, they don't like water. They won't like water. So ethanol is the best choice here. This oxygen hanging off, it is a non or an asymmetrical molecule and therefore more likely to like water. Oh, answer D, by the way, methanol, <laughs> ethanol. Taking a look at number six here. Based on the strength of the intermolecular forces in each substance, estimate from greatest to smallest the vapor pressures of each substance in liquid state at the same temperature. Now, we haven't actually talked about vapor pressure uh, in this video, as it is more of a gases topic. But the greater your vapor pressure is, the more likely you are to skip from the liquid phase to the gaseous phase. Right? The way that I always thought about this in high school was the more you felt the pressure, the more likely you are to crack Stand your ground, ladies and gentlemen. Stand your ground. You are what you are. Don't let the pressure get to you. Hold fast. So the greater your vapor pressure, the more likely you are to evaporate. If we're all liquids here, we're all liquids here, the more likely we are to evaporate. And so, of course, going from liquid to gas means disrupting or overcoming the intermolecular forces we are experiencing. So the one with the greatest vapor pressure is going to be the most likely to evaporate, a.k.a. the weakest intermolecular forces. The weakest intermolecular forces. And keep in mind, these structures are the exact same as the question from before. Uh, so we got still methanol, propane, ethene, ethanol. Um, so right away, I should be looking for um, what, what substance is going to be the most likely to evaporate? And the answer is our nonpolar dudes, ethene or propane. And so already right away, it's going to be between A or B as our answer. And yeah, you could look at the order of things too, but let, let's go ahead and describe all of these in terms of their vapor pressures in order to properly navigate this problem. So first off, just make sure you're paying attention to the question greatest to smallest, or if it's as smallest to greatest, that you know what order you're going into. Um, the greatest vapor pressure is going to be between our two weakest in terms of intermolecular forces structures, and that's propane and ethene. And so the question is, why is it one over the other? Well, both of these are nonpolar, which means they only have London dispersion forces to call upon in terms of their intermolecular forces. And LDFs are contingent upon how many electrons you have the more electrons you have the bigger the swish and the swoosh the bigger the rocking of the boat which is why propane is going to have a larger amount of ldfs than ethene where kids might get baited is that double bond but what you have to realize is that when something is boiling this double bond doesn't matter I'm not breaking bonds. I'm breaking attractions between the molecules. That's the difference between intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. So many would look at that double bond and go, oh, man, that guy, that's going to be a tough nut to crack. And you're right. 
But I'm not cracking that nut! I feel like I... Never mind. Never mind! So, Ethene is going to have the greatest vapor pressure because he's going to be the easiest to boil. The weakest intermolecular forces. So then that means propane is going to be second. And if we look at our answer choices, that means we already know it's going to be B. But why does it continue in this order? Why is it ethanol followed by methanol? Well, ethanol is a polar substance, but it doesn't have hydrogen bonding, and methanol does. Dip, dip, hydrogen bonding. Likewise, moving on to number seven, which redundant questioning here. Between propane and ethene, which will likely have the higher boiling point and why? Well, we already used this in, in assessing our answer to number six, but of course, because this is pulled from the same response or the same section of a review book, I feel like it's a redundant question. If, I feel like you're really lucky if you get something like this on your AP test. We already said that propane is going to be harder to boil than ethene, which means we should already have it narrowed down to A or B just based off that alone. And then we look at that. Oh, there's that double bond. Answer choice C is looking juicy to us. It's looking juicy. But you should know that there's a difference between intra and inter. C, not valid. Or ethene because it's smaller in size. Like, man, that's looking real good. It's tough to grab it. So small. But no, ethene is not the answer. It's between A or B. And the reason why the answer choices are what they are is because of the way teachers are kind of lazy in teaching it. And I'm guilty of it too. When we say that LDFs are typically the weakest intermolecular force, but they can't be strong. And they're stronger based on how big your molecule is. But when we say how big the molecule is, we're referring to how many electrons you have. Because if you've got more protons and you've got more neutrons, then inherently you have more electrons. Traditionally. So the bigger your molecule is, the more electrons you have at your disposal. But with that explanation, the bigger it is, you might say propane because it has a greater molar mass. But why is B the better answer? Because of what LDFs actually are. Propane because it has a more polarizable electron cloud. LDFs work because of the partial positives and negatives that are created by the movement of electrons around your atom. When more electrons are over here than over here, I get a partial negative and a partial positive. And the more electrons that are there, the bigger the rocking of the boat, the bigger the swishing and swooshing. Therefore, the more polarizable it is. The answer is B, 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 B. Now we're getting to our free response sections here. All of the substances are liquids at room temperature. Organize them from high to low in terms of boiling points, clearly differentiating between the intermolecular forces in each substance. So now we're going to use our big boy and girl words here, right? So we're not going to just list them. We're going to give an explanation for this. And so let's just start by defining what intermolecular forces are here because then the answer shall be clear to us. I got pentane. It's another hydrocarbon. Completely nonpolar, completely symmetrical. Just carbons, hydrogen, single bonds. This guy, only going to have LDFs. He's your lowest boiling point. Easy, easy, easy to boil. Then we're looking at propanal. The reason why we're looking at him is, well, he's not symmetrical. He's asymmetrical, all right. But that O is not attached to that H. Therefore, this guy is just polar and doesn't have hydrogen bonds. So this guy's got dip, dip. He is going to be your second lowest. Methanol and N-butylamine. Both of them have hydrogen bonds, so the question is, which one is better? Well, the more hydrogen bonds you got, the stronger you are. And even though this is hydrogen attached to O, and oh my gosh, that's, that's the kind of bond that water's got. That's not what it means. Hydrogen bonding is hydrogen attached to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. This guy's got two hydrogen bonds. This guy's got one. Therefore, N-butylamine will have the strongest intermolecular forces out of the options provided here, and therefore the highest boiling point. And so we've, we've explained all of it, right? It should only take a, three sentences to explain all of this. Um, and boom, there you go. On the methanol diagram, draw the locations of all dipoles. When you're looking at here, uh, you're looking at atoms that have a large discrepancy in terms of the electronegativity, so we're really staring at that oxygen here. Because oxygen has such a large electronegativity compared to most atoms. 
Uh, and so auction is going to have a partial negative um, in both of its bonds here. So that's that's what they want to show, is that auction is not only dominating the bond with hydrogen, it's also dominating the bond with carbon. And so you should actually put a partial negative on both sides of the auction, one to signify its bond with carbon, one to signify its bond with hydrogen. And then the carbon and the hydrogen will get a partial positive. Carbon and hydrogen are very similar in electronegativities, and I do see some debate online as to whether or not you even put a partial negative partial positive on there carbon slightly more electronegative than hydrogen but they're so close that it's effectively a non-polar bond which is why ap doesn't look for you to put the for the dipoles on carbons and hydrogen so just look at the the bigger differences in electronegativities that's going to be carbon and oxygen and then oxygen and hydrogen so make sure you do show both of those I, i'm not sure if you just put the partial negative on just the oxygen once if it would count it and butylamine is found to have the lowest vapor pressure at a room temperature out of the four liquids. Justify this observation in terms of intermolecular forces. Well, my goodness, if it ain't just question A all over again. And butylamine is found to have the lowest vapor pressure at room temperature out of the four liquids. Well, it's because it's got the strongest intermolecular forces. And because it's got the strongest intermolecular forces, it therefore is the hardest to disrupt those to make it go from the liquid to the gaseous phases. Therefore, N-butylamine, because it has two hydrogen bonds compared to all of the others, whereas methanol is a close second, it's got one hydrogen bond, N-butylamine will take the cake here. Easy answer. Easy answer, right? Two hydrogen bonds greater than one. Vapor pressure is your propensity to become a gas. The higher your vapor pressure, the more likely you are to become a gas. The more likely you are to crack under the pressure. Van butylamine, no pressure there, baby. No pressure. Number nine. We got a little table here. H2N2O2Cl2. Four Brinkloff molecules. Diatomic. Got their boiling points, bond lengths, and how strong those bonds are. Oh my gosh. What could we possibly do to confirm these things? Well, we could probably draw them. Draw those Lewis structures. A, explain the differences in the properties given in the table above for each of the following pairs. The bond strengths of N2 and O2. Why would N2 have nearly doubled the strength of O2? Draw it out. Find out. And you will very quickly be able to tell me the answer to that. N2 has a triple bond. O2 has a double bond. More electrons involved, more invested in the relationship between the two atoms, therefore stronger bond. The bond lengths of H2 and Cl2. Bond lengths. We've got H2.75, Cl2 1.99. Point to me where hydrogen is on the periodic table and where chlorine is on the periodic table because both of these have single bonds. Chlorine is significantly larger than hydrogen. Chlorine is on period three. Hydrogen is period one. The smallest atom out there. Chlorine is a little bit beefier and therefore the bond must be a little bit longer in order for those guys to make that relationship work. The boiling points of O2 and Cl2. O2, oh my gosh, it's a gas so much more readily. It ex it's such higher vapor pressure than Cl2. Why could this be? Especially when oxygen's got a, a double bond, like the bond is stronger. But once again... That's the difference between inter- and intramolecular forces. I'm not separating O's from O's when I'm boiling it. I'm separating O2's from O2's. So why does Cl2 have a much stronger set of intermolecular forces than O2? They're both nonpolar molecules. Therefore, they both only have LDFs at their disposal, which means that electrons are the name of the game, and Cl2 has much more electrons, a bigger swish and swoosh, than O2 does. Therefore, the answer? Well, I mean, it's not, we know CL2 is higher. Harder to boil. So, that's why. It's it's LDFs. The LDFs in CL2 are greater than, than O2. Use the principles of molecular bonding to explain why H2 and O2 are gases at room temperature, while H2O is a liquid at room temperature. I feel like they're handing this to you on a plate. And I had a similar question to this on my AP test whenever I was in high school. Uh, H2 and O2 are gas at room temperature because they only have LDFs. Draw them out. They are nonpolar molecules. Meanwhile, H2O is the poster boy for hydrogen bonding. Stronger intermolecular forces means harder to disrupt. 
means harder to make it go from a liquid to a gas. Whereas these guys, their intermolecular forces are so weak that the connection between those molecules isn't as strong. Therefore, they are more readily going to become a gas. Moving on to a Beer's Law example here. A student is instructed to determine the concentration of a solution of cobalt 2 chloride based on absorption of light spectrometric colorimetric method. A student is provided with a 0 0.10 molar solution with which to prepare a standard solution of concentration of 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, and 0 0.08 and assess the absorption in those. Describe the procedure for diluting the 0 0.10 molar solution to concentration of this, this 0 0.02 value. So you only need to do it for 0 0.02. How simple is this? M1V1 is equal to M2V2, baby. It's saying, how many milliliters from the original stock solution, the 0 0.10, do I need, followed by how much water do I need to make this a 0 0.02 molar solution? How freaking nice is that? M1V1 is equal to M2V2. And then they throw in the, the caveat of, and then tell us how much water you have to add afterwards, just that little detail. Like, it's just, how did you do it in the lab? You're going to do this... 15 times during your semester. M1V1 is equal to M2V2. This is your M1. Find out your V1 that you need in order to make M2V2. Piece of cake, baby. Not even going to solve it. You can do it. Identify the optimum wavelength for analysis given that these are their charts here. Remember, Every substance has an in, in ideal, in optimal wavelength for in which they absorb things. We absorb lights at different rates uh, on the visible spectrum, and different things absorb at different, uh, different wavelengths. I believe plants respond the best to blue, something like that. So if you just shine yellow and red and orange lights on them, they don't grow as well. But they like blue light a lot. Maybe it's not all plants. Maybe it's only some plants. But either way, we're all unique. So all you got to do is go to the peak of absorption here, uh, this chart right here. Between 480 and 520, I'm saying about 500, maybe 505 nanometers. And whenever it's a question like this where the chart's not explicitly like on a value that's very easily to tell, then they always have a little range that you can fall into. So the answer here should be about 500 nanometers. Easy. And then this other chart over here, which we didn't show earlier in the presentation, percent transmittance, you could probably figure out what it means. It's how much light is getting through, which means wherever this is lowest, this will be the highest because this is absorbing the most. So, wow, that's logical. Pretty nice. So about 500 nanometers here. And we get to our last questions here that are very similar. It's a very similar set of questions to the one before. In fact, I think it might be a sister question. Um, so we've measured the absorbance of all of these different concentrations. So we took our 0.02, our 0.04, and then all the way up to our stock solution of 0 0.10. And we saw how much the light was disrupted. The absorbance of the unknown solution, so we're trying to find the concentration of our unknown is 0.275. What is the concentration of the solution? And this is Beer's Law at its finest. When you have an unknown concentration, you can assess all these other variables in order to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. So 0.275. So all we have to do is go to the absorbance at 0.275, which is about right here. Boop, 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 boop. And would you look at that? It's smack in between 0 0.04 and 0 0.06. So the answer would be 0 0.050. And once again, there's probably a little range associated with this in which you would actually accept, which is pretty nice. Uh, Beer's Law is an expression that includes three factors that determine the amount of light that passes through a solution. Identify two of these factors. What's so strange about this is that this question came with this chart. Like, that, that's weird. What is this chart? This chart is a relationship of Beer's Law. But this question is also kind of cool in that all it's asking you to do is just hold on, let me find the slide it's just give me the variables for it like how cool is that it's just hey the equation is a is equal to abc what do those letters mean it's kind of cool so you've got concentration you've got absorbance you could even talk about the molar absorptivity and then the path length the distance that the light is traveling through that solution right and, of course, they're talking about uh, big A is your absorbance. So you can just put absorbance. But concentration is one of the answers you can just put right there, right? So you're looking at molar absorptivity uh, and path length is the other one. ABC is what you could put on there. Pretty cool. 
The student handles the sample container that holds the unknown solution and leaves fingerprints in the path of the light beam. How will this affect the calculated concentration of the solution? See electro greasy Cheeto dust covered fingers all over the cubette. Well, guess what? That's a lot of gunk that goes in the little window. And this spectrophotometer assesses how much light is going through it. Well, you just put a bunch of gunk on the outside of that tube, and guess what? Light is going to get stuck on that gunk. It's not going to be able to go through. Therefore, it's going to look like you're absorbing a whole lot more light than what your substance actually is. It's your Cheeto gunk that's absorbing it. So the concentration will appear higher with added oils on the cuvette. Gunk. Fingerprints. Not to mention the fact that the government can now track you. So yeah, concentration will get higher. If it's looking like you're absorbing more light, then you've got more stuff in there to scatter the light. Which we're hoping is just the stuff that we're assessing, which in this in this case is COCL2. But y you put all your fingerprints on it! So the concentration will appear higher. Why is this method of determining the concentration of COCL2 solution appropriate? Whereas using the same method for measuring the concentration of NaCl solution would not be appropriate. Now, this is a weird question. And I'll admit, this would be such a, a smaller topic that I don't know if I would be able to answer it when I was in high school. And believe me, I was freaking prepared. But this is niche. It's so niche that I wouldn't actually expect it on an AP test. I, I could be wrong. But like, this is small. This is a small, teensy-weensy detail in Beer's Law that I really wouldn't expect on a free response question. Um, but the fact that I saw it in a review book is why I included it. The fact that there is the potential for it. Maybe. I, I don't know. Whereas using the same method for the measuring the concentration of NA sales solution would not be appropriate. And the answer, I think, would have to be demonstrated by you doing labs with this in your class. Why did you use colored solutions? And don't you know what salt does in water? It just dissolves it. It doesn't turn it purple. It just dissolves. It's colorless. Therefore, increasing the concentration of salt is not going to really disrupt the pathway of light. And therefore, it wouldn't meet the criteria. You probably wouldn't be able to make a linear plot to follow Beer's Law with it. Whereas COCL2 is one of the most common examples of solutions that you use for beers when you're learning about it, but it's also been mentioned throughout here. And you'll also know at this time that cobalt is either blue or red in solution. It has those colors associated with it. And so salt just dissolves. And if I had more and more and more salt pushing to the, the limit in which uh, a certain amount of water could actually hold, it doesn't actually change its appearance, like, at all. Doesn't get cloudy, doesn't get foggy. So why would light be any more disrupted? That's why. It's colorless, and the particles are so small that when they dissociate, that they don't actually disrupt any pathway of the light. So you couldn't actually follow the Beer's Law plot. Anything related to that, and I think you're going to get the points for it. Wow, that actually went pretty quick, I would say. There was a lot of... A lot of talk in this great episode of Corona Chemistry. But you know what? It's about that time. And gosh, we've, we've come along so far already. And I'm proud of you. You hear me? I'm proud of you. We'll see you next time. Corona Chemistry.